Thank you, Wendy, for that introduction. It's wonderful to be back in Cambridge. Thanks for the weather. Beautiful, beautiful city. Lovely place to cycle around. And I've been lucky this afternoon. I didn't arrive until 2, 2 30 and uh, at 3 o'clock I was out on a bike with Jim Chisholm and Edward Lee and Robin Hayden, who had a bunch of. Um, and uh, I got a bit of education about uh, transport. In, in Cambridge and really important education so thank you Jim for organising that um, okay fine no no I'll, I'll, I'll do it otherwise I'll yeah I'll uh, panic I'll panic if I do it there we are so um, I uh, I sort of became mayor of Bristol I went to the University of Bristol uh, in 1965, so you work out how old uh, And uh, I arrived, never having lived in a city, I travelled travelled the world with my dad, who was in the military, and um, lived in many different places. And I fell in love with living in the city, right in the heart of the city, very early on. And the university that was. Sorry. So could you call the mic? Yeah. Okay. Have you not been hearing me? Yes, no. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, in a university that uh, is implanted in the centre of the city, unlike Cambridge, which is a city that's grown around the university, Bristol is a university that is absolutely at the heart of what was an industrial city, what was a thriving city, which was a city with an ugly past, a slaving past, a, a very different city to Cambridge in many ways. But I think in this talk you will see a lot of parallels. An extraordinary situation resulted in me becoming the first elected mayor of Bristol. I believed in us having stronger government because I felt that we had faffed around for too long and that we hadn't really got to grips with things. So when the government gave us the opportunity for major cities in the UK, for the core cities in the UK, to vote as to whether to have an elected mayor or not. I led a bit of the charge on that, not in any way thinking that I would end up being that elected mayor. But it became clearer to me as we went on through that process, and we won it, and Bristol was the only city out of 11 that actually went to a public vote that uh, resulted in uh, a positive vote for having an elected mayor. Um, it became clearer to me that it would have more value if that was an independent rather than a party mayor. Because I feel very strongly that while the many, many people, many, many politicians are there for the best of purposes, and most politicians, I believe, are there for the best of purposes, they are through their parties, driven through through a process that means that their raison d'etre is to be re-elected. And to be re-elected you have to be ever so careful. And you mustn't upset people. And by some extraordinary turn of fate I got elected as this independent. I took them by surprise because they didn't really believe it could, could happen. And I thought, well, I've got three and a half years, that's all I had. I might get a second term, but I'm not bargaining on it. And now I know that was sensible. <laughs> not to do anything in order to get re-elected. Do what you believe is right. As an architect, I've always had a very environmental, sustainable agenda. As an architect, I've always felt it's about the people, stupid, not about the buildings. It's about the place, it's about the spaces, it's about the life in the city. I paraphrase Churchill in that quote that Wendy gave, saying that uh, we build our cities and thereafter they shape our children. I believe that very strongly. I believe that children should be at the heart of the planning of our cities because it's their future. And I don't believe they would have chosen them to have gone down the route they'd gone if they had had the opportunity. And I think we need to do a lot to redress what has happened over the last 
70 years, my lifetime, in order to leave cities really healthy places. So first of all, I think cities need a great, a great ambition, great vision, and this is why I start with this slide and say, yes, we're a small city. We're a small city of half a million, grown to about 650,000 urban area. We burst out of our own boundary. Um, you're a smaller city, more of a gem in many ways, less industrial, but you are bursting out of your own boundaries as well with all the challenges that that gives. But thinking in world terms, in terms of what does the world think of Cambridge, is really important. Cambridge is a world city, like Bath, a tinier city than Cambridge, is a world city in that it's recognised across the world because of its history. And uh, maintaining that history is so important. I think any city has got to have great ambition about being the place that you want to raise your family. Being a healthy environmental place. But giving too. I think a good city is one that gives, that lends, that shares. That shares with other places. We cannot be insular. I'm not saying that we have to be global in all our thinking. I very strongly believe in the local economy and the circular economy and in looking to the local traditions in making a good city. But being part of that global environmental mission. Climate change is here. Climate change is man-made. Don't let Nigel Lawson or any other such person persuade you otherwise. We owe it to our children to do something about it. And it's our cities that can change that more than anything. So I'm not here to tell Cambridge what to do. Heavens help me. But to share some of that thinking. <coughs> Bristol is much of a harder edge city. It's a gritty city in many ways. We are a sister brother city with, with Bath, which is only 12 minutes away by train. A very different place. I would say that Bath has the beauty and Bristol has the brawn, but we have a beauty of our own. We have a third of our public space is green or blue in terms of water or trees and grass. I don't know what the proportion is in Cambridge, in a way that's meaningless. But it's very important to both our cities that the public places, the public spaces are kept in terms of, of quantity, but more important that they're improved in terms of quality. I actually think you can make changes to public space and to greenery, but, and that it's the quality of the edges that often define the quality of the place. We're a city that uh, has had a long history. We've had a history of the killing industries. I mentioned slavery, of tobacco, of drink, of chocolate. But um, of also, we're a city that uh, gave birth to the phrase, uh, see um, Bristol fashion, um, what, what's the phrase? <laughs> see, yeah. She sh C shape and Bristol fashion, sorry. Um, so we've been a shipbuilding city, been not anymore. We now make balloons which um, give us a lot of international publicity because they fly over the city frequently, especially in these days like today. There's something gone wrong with my graphics here, but anyway, something shot off, Healthy Schools Award shot off to the left. No, 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 it's fine. No, no, no. Um, so, the first, the first issue, I believe, in making a good place is to share that ambition across the city. To raise awareness. To raise awareness with the young, with the old. And to do that, to define what a greener city means. I've talked about health. I believe that health actually is the best way of grabbing people's attention. It's something that people care about. 
they understand it more. We understand about the value of our health more than we do about so many other things, about such vague things as sustainability. But health we understand, and it is exactly the same thing. The health of the city is about the health of the individual. It's very important that we bring together, like you have brought together, the campaigners for environmental awareness. And this could be physical and social awareness as well. In Bristol we had a vision for creating a green capital before Europe thought of the European green capital, certainly before it established it. And we established a, year, a green capital partnership, a partnership that grew to about 200 organisations across the city that believed in the greening of the city. And that partnership is what drove the final, uh, the final uh, success of us uh, becoming European Green Capital. And now that's a partnership of 800 organisations. Partly because we made it a condition during Green Capital that to qualify for a grant for uh, initiative during 2015, our Green Capital year, that you had to be part of the Green Capital Partnership. That got many members, but interestingly they stuck there and they are driving the uh, whole green agenda forward. So that is a real result of us having been European Green Capital. We have one week in the year, Big Green Week. Europe now has European Green Week. And that is an opportunity for us to bring people to the city who will the, the, the Jonathan Porritts of this world and others who uh, can share their thinking about the greening of the city, the, uh, about climate change and all the other issues. And there we, and that was an excuse for me to take on some, of, or to try out some of the experiments that, uh, that, that I tried during my um, during my time as mayor. I do believe that consultation is important, but sometimes consultation is meaningless until people have experienced what you're consulting about. So experimentation is important, and being brave with that experimentation is important, rather than shirking it because you're going to do yet more consultation. Just do it, see how it turns out, if it works, repeat it. If it doesn't, bury it. And I think politicians need to be more sure of themselves in, in trying things out, in, in experimenting. And one of my little experiments was one tree per child. It just occurred to me one day during the election that I would get every child in the city, every primary school child in the city, to plant a tree. Okay, that was 30,000 trees in the first year. But not a huge number of trees, but it had a lot of meaning to every child. It was, a, it was a learning exercise, it was an education in itself. It wasn't just planting the tree, it was learning about food, it was learning about the air, it was learning about archaeology in some cases where they dug up bits when they were planting their trees. And it was about pride, it was about caring for for their neighbourhood, it was involving the community in where the trees were planted. So one tree per child, just the, it was just an idea, has now become something that has been taken up by cities in Australia, in Japan, uh, in Africa, and it's such a simple thing, and I talk to many mayors across the world, and they grasp it because it's something they can do, and they don't have to consult too much about it, it doesn't cost too much because it's pretty bloody obvious that people are going to like it. <laughs> Healthy Schools Awards, because I wanted to make quite sure that all the schools were involved in this project, and so giving them a bit of competition about, uh, 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 about, about uh, making their schools greener and healthier, getting them to walk to work and cycle to work and that sort of thing. Make something special, I'll talk more about that. Make Sunday Special was another excuse to make changes, to experiment, and just to suck it and see whether people liked it or not. 
Refill Bristol you may have heard of, it was an initiative we started European, dur during European Green Capital where we said to every restaurant, uh, any, any place that people come to the public where there is a tap, um, just take your bottle there and refill it. We, we can't put fountains all around the city but we can find a practical way of reducing the amount of uh, single-use plastic uh, and plastic bottles that have become such a scandal. And refill Bristol has been taken up by the government as, uh, as, as an initiative across the, uh, across the country. City leadership, I believe, is about enabling. I think Bristol's a great city in spite of its leadership. It's not a great city because of its leadership. It's a great city because there are lots of individuals there who take initiatives, who do things. John Grimshaw is an example who started Sustrans, and, uh, which is the connection that led to me cycling around Cambridge. An individual who saw that by doing something really positive, he could help change the city and could give so much more beyond the city, which Sustrans have done uh, around the whole of this country and given examples to other, uh, to other places. So leadership to me is about saying yes. It is about enabling individuals just to get on with it. There is a lot of circus in Bristol. I just said get on with it. They started a, a, a biannual uh, for circus. I think leadership is about making those little things happen and then just giving space, maybe, not money always, and, uh, and enabling organisations to flourish. And sometimes fail. And not winding about that because failure is the greatest uh, is the greatest uh, lesson. And so, giving permission to dream to um, to people and organisations really important. So here is the Green Capital Partnership. Um, this was not when we won Green Capital, but uh, but sometime before. But was showing that we had. A, yeah, that we, we'd written a purpose for ourselves. A very important thing that I hardly need to say here is that City and our two universities uh, work very closely together. Together, I established a, a monthly get-together with my two vice-chancellors, my two vice-chancellors, Bristol's two vice-chancellors, and uh, we saw ourselves as a team. We saw the universities as being absolutely central to the governance of the city. And um, it was the university that provided the majority of the volunteering during our European Green Capital. 100,000 hours of volunteering time during that, that, during that year. And the students loved it. But more importantly, involving the university in some of the research about how we could achieve some of the <coughs> targets that we set ourselves, or whether we could achieve them. And uh, so those partnerships, very, very important. But maybe the most important thing, I think, is to make citizens proud about their own city. I don't know if cynicism is a special Bristol quality, but cynicism is very rife in my city and that anybody in a situation in leadership is quite clearly there for their own good and uh, not for the good of the city. And I think changing that is vitally important and working with the leaders in the city is vitally important. Even now, even two years after I ceased to be mayor, if you engage with me on social media, you'll get the knocking from those who I will explain about later, who just believe because you are doing things, you are there for the wrong reasons. So making citizens proud, sharing the story, seems to me really important. Identifying who owns the city. Bristol is very complex. It is, uh, it is uh, <coughs> complex ethnically. Um, we have a huge uh, variety of cultures, um, 91 different languages, uh, 45 different religions. And these are not just the odd one. These are, these are major movements we've had in the city over the last 20 years. And uh, I think it's enriched the city. It's enriched the city in our food culture. So during European Green Capital, we brought together 
different people, people from different food cultures to share their to share their food, to share their cooking, and this is something that we uh, we, we we reach for in many many occasions to an organisation called 91 Ways that was born out of European Green Capital that uh, that that gives food uh, that gives or sells food for events and. Uh, it's a wonderful way of discovering, having conversations about different people's different ways of life. And we started Fair Share. Fair Share is an organisation that is saving tons and tons of wasted food. An absolute scandal. We just should not tolerate it. And Fair Share is now uh, reaching right across the country in working with the supermarkets and others in uh, ensuring that we, set, that, that we throw away much less of our food and hopefully only the food that simply cannot be reused in any way. Um, but, uh, so, fill your bellies, not your bins. Something that we feel very strongly about is creating a happy city. I think Wendy referred to the happy city. To me, the happiest city is the, is the city of the circular economy. The city that, that's the high street with many independents. The city where people know each other and look out for each other. The economics of happiness. And we'll be holding an economics of happiness conference in, uh, in Bristol on the 20th of October at uh, Arnolfini Arts Gallery um, and uh, do to come and register for it. We'll be holding it at the same time as the Global Parliament of Mayors that is coming to Bristol um, to have a conference primarily on, uh, on, on environmental matters. So what is the encouraging circular economy? It's about celebrating local independence, celebrating our skills locally. Um, I think there is a danger that we always you know, I, I was uh, waiting for somebody at the station, so I waited in one of these chain coffee shops. I much prefer to have waited in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a local barista's place, but, um, and I think life is so much more interesting uh, when one gets that variety. We created our own currency. And I gave that a boost because it, it was uh, created by friends and others friends of mine and others, um, uh, just before I became mayor, and I said that if I became mayor, I would take my pay in Bristol pounds. That means that all my salary had to be spent within local independence. That was fun. That meant I had to eat out quite a lot, but it was always interesting food. It meant I bought, bought more flowers than I would have done otherwise because of the local florist taking them. I think that it was, it was the economics of happiness to me. I still have quite a few Bristol pounds and I have fun with them. But it's a minority sport, but it's a strong signal about the importance of where you spend your money. And it is about local. It is about the bigger environment. It is about reducing the amount we move stuff which has a huge impact on the environment. It is about changing local food culture, about growing locally, about changing this madness where 95% of the food that's grown around our cities is taken away to somewhere else and wrapped about two or three times and has fresh stamped on it and then it's distributed somewhere else. It's madness. It's about encouraging mixed-use development, getting rid of the monocultures. And we've got to change that, this idea that housing, housing is a place. Housing is not a place. Housing is a commodity. Homes are places, but those homes are so much better when they're walkable, when they're places when you can get what you want close by. 
We encourage a lot of local energy cooperatives. This is nothing about city leadership about, apart from working with them and saying yes. And in the end, we, we launched our own energy company, Bristol Energy. Buy your energy off Bristol Energy. It'll be good for the environment and it'll be um, quite good for my city. But it's about doing things differently. It is about sometimes being prepared to be a bit funky and wacky and a bit punchy. We don't like Tesco very much and we showed it. I'm not entirely proud, but I'm quite proud that Bristol is the only city that actually had a riot against the supermarket. <laughs> and we gave birth to Banksy. And, um, Okay, this imagery is not all lovely, but it's edgy, it makes people think, it's witty, it's anarchic. And I think to make interesting places, you have to be a bit anarchic. You have to think about the rules that are worth breaking. I don't believe you make a good place in planning terms without breaking some rules. I talked about the Bristol Pound. It's about enabling activity in the streets. We used to have in Bristol a medieval law that enabled the city to run a market and nobody else. And the city held on to that. And I fought the city before I was mayor. And they threatened to take me to court and then rethought it because they could see that I might not win the court case but I would win the argument. That we should be entirely liberal about enabling people to have markets. So now we are a market city. And it makes a huge difference. It's not just about the centre of the city. We have markets in, in other communities and it makes a huge difference to people's perception about their area. And it gives the opportunity for small, small businesses to start up and thrive. I know many market stores that have turned into restaurants and shops and other businesses. And uh, so, that's important. This is one of my cafes. I, I also confess I'm not just an architect, I'm also a restaurateur and a brewer and uh, I believe very strongly in making those things happen that animate the buildings that I create as an architect. And to me that, as I started, is more important than the object, the building. It is the content that makes it important. Now, we have a developer who's followed that principle really brilliantly recently um, and has created a new development that would otherwise be housing on a route that uh, connects the north and the south of the city. It's a strong pedestrian and cycling route and he's now put in this development 30 independent businesses and it's really thriving. It's only been there for 18 months and uh, it, he's had instant success out of it because it's caught people's imagination and people like to go to these independents whether they're bicycle manufacturers or cafes or, um, or bamboo um, makers or I mean people who make things out of bamboo I mean I just think of lots of different things that happen here that inspire people and they come there not just to drink beer and it's important that we think how we clean the air in, with every possible opportunity. And it's something that I took really seriously as mayor about investing in the, not just in the city, but uh, through the cooperatives and others in, in renewable energy to make sure that we, uh, that, that we clean up our air, not just through the reduction in traffic. I go back to working with the children. I would say there's a collective noun for those who resist change, that's adults, <laughs> and that children are open to change, and if you catch them at the right time, you can really enthuse, really enthuse them. We've got children in the schools that now choose to have salad. Now there are not many children in the school, in, uh, before that that choose to have salad, they do because they grow it. They run their own salad bars. They, uh, they, they're encouraging their parents to let them walk to school. We created a, an app that we gave a prize to called Crocodile, 
to enable parents to have the assurance that their children are walking to school with other children, that they are able to see where the children are going and whether they've arrived or not. Giving people confidence to make those changes. I talked about the Healthy School Awards, the enormous enthusiasm that we got out of that. And I, I bumped into the team in a cafe the other day and uh, they said it's just one of the best things that's happened and I got the children to produce a book. And it's not, it, you cannot start too early with these things. And it was really inspiring to see some of the teachers who were teaching cooking um, to the, uh, to the, to the, and the chef in this, in her whites here, uh, one of the, won one of the BBC uh, Food and Farming Awards for Chef of the Year um, in a, a nursery school in Bristol. But using fun is uh, a theme that I will always come back to. We're lucky in Bristol that we gave birth to Ardman Animations, uh, David Sprotson, Peter Lord, uh, who um, nearly as old as me, and I knew them well when they were making Morph, and they've grown into uh, Oscar-winning uh, industry and uh, created the animation industry in Bristol. But they're very generous, and they lend us their, their characters for campaigns. And SustainableShawn.com is a game that the children now play, building their own sustainable city. They may be planting trees, this is one tree per child. But maybe the most difficult thing I had that uh, I will spend my last five minutes on is tackling transport. People's cars are... Oh, oh what's that? About? Oh, God. That's um, some spooky thing on my phone. Um, people hang on to their cars for dear life. It's their private space. Rich or poor, it's vitally important to them. We created wonderful cities before we had cars. And when the car came along, we started knocking down some of those cities and widening our roads. And now we don't build streets anymore, not enough. We build roads and highways. <coughs> And that has led to a certain amount of sprawl that means that we become car dependent. And it is a vicious circle. And that car dependency means that it's very difficult for anybody to go back on where we've gone. But I believe very strongly that we've got to face this head on. And that the biggest spoiler of our places of living, the biggest spoiler of our cities has been the, the motor car. So these are some of the things that uh, I felt that needed to be tackled. The car, I've always said, our mistress and master, but an urban disaster. <laughs> these are charming places. Clifton, beautiful suburb, not a suburb anymore of Bristol, but a wonderful urban village absolutely dominated by the car. This is the reaction I got from the quite wealthy residents of Clifton. The one who's trying to hide himself was a planner who um, realised I might see this photograph. They were carrying coffins. They brought out a tank. I was the enemy because I wanted to bring in a residence parking scheme. There were 13 hairdressers. They thought they would all go out of business. All the small shops said they would go out of business because nobody would be able to drive there anymore. Well, the fact was, people were driving around in circles, not being able to park because there was no organisation. It seemed to me a no-brainer that we needed a residence parking scheme. And it wasn't just in Clifton. It was in 12 major areas in the outer centre of the city. We, we, of course we'd had car parking restrictions in the centre of the city. And one had been brought in in two years. Now if we'd carried on at that rate it would have taken 20 years to have done what I did in three. I just said, I called in the transport guy when I got elected and I said, what's the plan? Shall we bring in congestion charge 
or shall we just stop commuters parking? And uh, we looked at both, and he said, well, we've got this scheme of doing the residents' parking, and we're doing one every 18 months. Well, that would have, that was 20 areas, so it would have taken 30 years. I, took, I said, well, let's do them all. That led to a lot of resistance, political resistance, because it was seen as something that would damage me. I reduced it to 12, but we delivered the 12, and there are eight more to be done, and I would like to see those done, but I think, I'm not sure there is the political courage to do it now. I walk across Bristol now, everybody thanks me for it. They didn't get it. They feel shy about it. Some don't thank me because they just feel shy about it, but it works. And I think that is what I mean about Leadership, it's got to be iterative. You've got to take some brave decisions. You've just got to do it and then see what happens. Before my time, but I was involved with it, we took out a major highway going across one of our Georgian squares. That was a four-lane highway to a dual carriageway with King William III um, by Reisbrack, one of the finest equestrian statues in Europe, sitting in the middle of the central reservation. It's mad what we've done to some of our cities. We, we, um, some of us bought the cranes uh, in, uh, in order to uh, save them from get, being scrapped. We bought them off the scrap merchant that the city had sold them to. and. Um, embarrass the city by selling them back to the city and using the money that we'd raised to start the ferry service. Those are little actions. Anybody can do it. Buying the cranes cost us 3,000 quid. And we sold them back to the city, I think, for 3,000 quid. Then sold them the scrap merchant for 2,000 quid. And we bought a wreck of a ferry and we started it. And the ferry is now one of the most iconic attractions in Bristol. We reclaim our streets, not just in the centre, as I said, but uh, there is a great project, I will shamelessly say it's a great project, it was started by my daughter called Playing Out, which is about giving children the street after school. And uh, it becomes a community attraction. Much better to make our streets uh, untidy than um, filling them up with dirty air. It's an excuse for change. We do everything we can in a hilly city to encourage cycling. We actually have achieved a huge amount in spite of the fact that it is, uh, it is a hilly city. I talked, about, I talked about opening our streets, not about closing them. I think the language is really important. Awful, the language of change is always so negative. Let's always think about the posit using positive language for change, because I think you don't want to um, be too PR-ish about it, but I do think of it now as opening streets. I do think of it as enabling people to be safe playing in the street. And uh, Make Sunday Special was an instant hit. Those businesses that had thought it was going to stop them trading hadn't realised that it's not cars that buy things, it's people. And so they got it quite, they got it wrong saying road open, I meant it to be street open, but anyway, the, 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 you get the message. And uh, that's something that I learned from other places. Not one thing I did was original. It's about looking elsewhere, it's about looking to Bogota, to Bordeaux to anywhere else that begins with B that uh, I feel a relationship with Bristol and learning from them and I do believe that a thousand little things makes a bigger difference than one big infrastructure change so it's inspiring those little things some silliness you now because we've got hills we can do things Cambridge can't even dream <laughs> And it's not just about streets, it's even about highways. You know, in Germany, I've been to see a highway, a motorway, that they'd had a picnic on. 
This is down the Avon Gorge, the most beautiful place. We should never have built a road down it. It's the A4. Take the traffic out and you can hear the birds and you can breathe and the kids love it, everybody loves it. You can do it in the community. And I come back to this thriving local circular economy which is so important. And make some noise about it. Don't be afraid of a bit of disruption. I think politicians are afraid of disruption. A little bit of chaos is great. And I talked about breaking rules and learning from other places. This is a beautiful, beautiful little street. One of my favorite streets. You can almost reach across it. In the daytime, it's cupboards on one side. They open the cupboards and they become fruit and vegetable shops. Nighttime, it's cupboards on the other side and they open the cupboards and they become bars. And you have to sort of barge your way down the street but it's Bologna's best street. It breaks every planning and building regulation you could think of. We have to break the rules to make those great places. Anyway, that is it. I will just say that I thank the EU for the huge amount of support they gave us. I won't thank anybody beginning with Nigel. And <laughs> now Green Capital comes with money because we didn't get any, but I felt it was important. We became that small city that made a difference in Paris because we were European Green Capital. We twinned with Paris in creating the city initiative in, at, the, at COP21 that hadn't existed before. I came back from Paris swearing that we'd make Bristol zero carbon by 2050. Well, it's others have got to achieve that. But we've started the path. We're working with the university on how we achieve that. We're chipping away. Thank you.